After watching this video, you should be able to describe glycogenesis or glycogen synthesis, list the major locations where glycogen synthesis occurs, recall that all the steps occur in the cytosol. You should also be able to name the intermediate of glycolysis that enters the glycogenesis pathway, recall the important enzymes used by glycogenesis, and describe the hormonal regulation of glycogenesis and correlate that with the fasting and well-fed state. Okay, so let's start big picture like we always do. And what we want to understand is that the major locations of glycogen synthesis occur in two spots, the liver and skeletal muscle. Now, it's important to contrast the, um, these two locations and why glycogen synthesis is occurring there. When we're talking about the liver, glycogen synthesis is important because it's going to provide a, sed a steady stream of glucose to the bloodstream during periods of fasting. And in general, uh, most people have about 10 to 18 hours worth of glycogen stores to help um, bring the glucose back up when we're fasting. Once you get past that, the liver's glycogen stores get exhausted and you need to rely on other carbon sources and we'll discuss that in more detail when we, when we go into the, the details of uh, gluconeogenesis. For skeletal muscle, the glycogen that's there is not to help provide glucose to the blood, but rather provide um, glucose molecules that, um, that can go in to the glycolytic pathway and provide a source of ATP for skeletal muscle contraction. So really, the skeletal muscle is quite selfish with respect to glycogen, and the liver, it's mostly there, right, to help out the rest of the body during periods of fasting. Okay? Now, there is one other important aspect to knowing that these are the two locations where glycogen synthesis occurs, because there are disorders, um, they're not common, but they do occur, um, that there's derangement of glycogen metabolism, either glycogen synthesis as well as glycogen breakdown. And when individuals are born with these um, inherited uh, defects in glycogen metabolism, the two locations that can be affected are the liver and skeletal muscle. Now, depending on what enzyme is defective and how it's, how it's uh, mutated, you might have one or the other or both of these affected. But it's important to recognize that these are the major sites of pathophysiology in those types of disorders. So it had, there's some clinical relevance as well with respect to disease. Now, it is important also to have a, a good understanding of the structure of glycogen. And um, to summarize this as simple as we can, um, it's a branch chain polysaccharide. So it's a bunch of glucose molecules all strung together with lots of branching. And the branching is important because, for, for two reasons. One, um, when we want to mobilize glycogen, we have lots of spots that we can draw from rather than one linear chain. And when we talk about glycogen breakdown or, or glycogenolysis, we'll, we'll be able to see that a little bit better. Also, um, because it can be um, branched this way, we can pack in a lot of glycogen um, into the liver, right? It's, it's more efficient packing. So, um, there, there, there's some very important reasons why branching is important, and it's very good that we are able to do this. Um, and the other aspect that I want to point out is that the, um, the linkages of the glucoses come in two flavors. The, the glucoses can be linked through an alpha-1,4 glycosidic bond, okay, and these branch points have an alpha-1,6 glycosidic bond. Okay, and so these will be important because depending on what kind of enzymes we have, um, we'll be able to take advantage of these bonds and either break and form them uh, during glycogen metabolism. So these are the two main flavors of glycogen linkages. And then finally, in terms of regulation, we always want to think about fasting in a well-fed state, the effects of insulin and glucagon. And fortunately, it's, it's, it's so simple and so straightforward that we'll, we'll include it in this video rather than having a separate video. Okay, so this is the big picture, location, a little bit about structure, and regulation. Now, before we go into the details, let's do a review again. So, let's go back to this diagram, okay, and we can see here, this is just a summary of all the metabolic reactions, and here we go again, we have all of these guys grouped together, and we can see that glycogenesis is in this grouping of glycolysis, fatty acid synthesis, triglyceride synthesis, and pentose phosphate shunt 
in the liver. So what that means is that when glycogen synthesis is turned on, at the same time, glycolysis is active, we're making fatty acids and triglycerides, and we're running the pentose phosphate shunt to provide NADPH to drive some of these reductive biosynthetic reactions. And simultaneously, because we don't want to have futile cycles, when glycogenesis is on, we're turning off glycogen breakdown. Because it wouldn't make any sense to build up glycogen just to break it down. And we can see glycogenolysis is grouped with gluconeogenesis, beta oxidation or fatty acid oxidation, and ketogenesis. Okay, so just like before, we want to have this in mind when we're thinking about regulation. And we'll get back to this um, at the very end when we, when we discussed fasting and well-fed state and how that impacts glycogenesis. Now, if we go and um, take these reactions and look at it more schematically uh, drawn out, what that might look like in the liver, we look, we, we look into something like this. So here we are in the liver, and if we just go to the well-fed state for a second, we see that we have glucose going into the liver through GLUT2, the constitutively present glucose transporter, and then glucose goes to G6-phosphate, and that enzyme is glucokinase. That's the first step of glycolysis. And if we were just looking at glycolysis like we did in another video, the G6-phosphate then would go all the way down to 2-pyruvate, we'd have some acetyl-CoA, we'd be making fatty acids, some cholesterol, triglycerides, and all that would be happening. Now, at the same time, we also want to be uh, saving up some of this glucose as glycogen for the reasons we discussed earlier, right? So when we're in the fasting state, over here on the left side, we want to be able to mobilize that glycogen to make G6-phosphate, right, which then can go and easily be converted to glucose and then go out the liver cell down as concentration gradient. And so um, it's important when, we're, when they're having the liver take up glucose that not all of it go down glycolysis and do all the stuff down here. We want to siphon some of that off and build up our glycogen stores during periods of fasting when we're going to need it. Okay, so this is just another review of the big picture of these pathways and how they're all working together. Okay, so now let's take a look at... Um, the reaction of glycogen synthesis in a little more detail. Now, what we have here is a cartoon schematic of um, glucose being taken up by the two cells, cell types that we talked about earlier, right? The liver, hepatocytes, and skeletal muscle. And notice that I did make a point here that there are different glucose transporters involved. So we, we're pretty familiar with the GLUT2 transporter. We've seen that a lot in a lot of the videos. That's the, recept that's the transporter that's present on the liver. Okay, It's also found on beta cells of the pancreas, and, and that's important for glucose-mediated insulin secretion. But in the case of the liver, this is always around. It's going to be taken up down its concentration gradient, and then we have our glucose inside the liver cell. Well, um, skeletal muscle can't have constitutively active glucose transporters. We don't, we don't want that. We want the glucose transporters to be translocated to the membrane only when we want the skeletal muscle to be taking up glucose. We don't really need those glucose transporters there uh, during periods of fasting because the skeletal muscle can't release glucose anyway, so it really wouldn't make any sense to, ha to have it there. So there's a different transporter, GLUT4, that's the one that's regulated by insulin. And in another uh, video that when we talk about insulin-mediated effects, we, we looked at how the insulin transduction pathway triggers the translocation of these transporters to the surface of skeletal muscle. Now, regardless of what transporter we're talking about, once these transporters are able to take glucose up and glucose is inside the cell, either skeletal muscle or liver, all this rest of this stuff is all the same. Okay, so really the big difference between these two cells in terms of this pathway is just the glucose transporter that's present um, to take it in. Now, here's our glucose inside either the skeletal muscle or liver cell, and we can see here that this first step of phosphorylation of glucose is our first step of glycolysis, and that enzyme, remember, is glucokinase in the liver and hexokinase in skeletal muscle. Either way, they're doing the same thing. They're phosphorylating glucose, trapping it inside the cell and committing it to a variety of different pathways. We're ignoring in this picture, we're not, we're not drawing in um, the glycolytic pathway or the pentose phosphate shunt, although we know those would be happening as well. We're just focusing on the glycogen synthesis pathway. 
So we can see here that the G6 phosphate is going to be converted to glucose 1-phosphate. And that is um, going to be done by an enzyme called phosphoglucomutase. I'm not even writing it in here because it's reversible. There's really no important clinical correlations, and, and it's not regulated in any way. So we're not going to add that on there as an important enzyme. But it is there, and it's going to be interconverting G6-phosphate to G1-phosphate. Okay? Now, what we need to do is we need to get the glucose in a form that's deliverable to our glycogen chain. And the way that works is we take a uridine triphosphate, okay, and we load on the glucose molecule onto that molecule. We release a pyrophosphate, and we end up with a uridine diphosphate glucose, um, glucose donator, okay? So this is going to be the mechanism of how we donate those glucose molecules to the growing glycogen chain. Okay, and that enzyme has a name too. A big surprise. It's UDP glucose pyrophosphorylase, okay, and I, I'm just pointing out this pyrophosphate here because when we hydrolyze the, the pyrophosphate through a pyrophosphatase, we make these two inorganic phosphates, this is a very energetically favorable reaction, and it's linked and it's coupled to this reaction, and it really helps this reaction move forward, um, so, so that's why I added this, this little step in over here, okay, with the pyrophosphate. Any case, we have the UDP glucose, and now it's ready to donate glucose molecules to the growing glycogen chain. Now, what I have drawn here is a, or, a already well-formed glycogen chain, um, a string of glucoses. Keep in mind that if this is very depleted, like let's say we, we went through a fast and we, we got through all of our glycogen stores, there is a way to get things started and there's a protein, a very special protein called glycogenin which um, serves as a primer to get the process started. It has even some enzyme activity to, auto, um, to do autoglucosylation just to get um, an initial primer started to add glycogen to that. I, I left it off this, um, this diagram just because it would get too complicated, but just keep in mind there is a molecule called glycogen and that, that is important in getting, initiating the glycogen synthesis process. In, a, in any case, we have already this process started. We have a, a, a in this case, a long glycogen chain already, and we, want to, we just want to add one more in the schematics. And so the enzyme that's going to do that is called glycogen synthase. Now, I wrote this enzyme in because this is an important enzyme because it is the site of regulation. Okay, so it's a, it's a regulated enzyme, so we really want to know about it. And the name's easy because it has glycogen in the name, and it has synthase, which helps us remember that as part of the glycogen synthesis pathway. So it's a pretty easy enzyme to remember. Uh, now, we see here that um, there are like 13 of these glucose molecules all strung together in these alpha-1-4 linkages. And all we're doing in this schematic here is we're just adding another one. So we add another little circle. So now we have, we're going from 13 of these things to 14. Okay, there's no reason why I picked those numbers. It just works out nice in this diagram. Okay, so it just got increased by one glycogen. Uh, one glucose, rather. Now, as we said earlier, um, glycogen is a branched molecule. All right, so this isn't going to be sufficient. This is a linear chain. This is very insoluble. We don't really want it in this form. Uh, we talked about the advantages of having a branched molecule, and so we need to branch this thing. And the way we do that, big surprise, this enzyme name is called branching enzyme. Okay. Now, if you watch what happens when we go from this linear molecule to, to this branch molecule, notice that what we've done is we've cleaved or hydrolyzed an alpha-1-4 bond, okay, and then we've created an alpha-1-6, all right, that's indicated right there, okay, where we have this branch point. And so we're really just, just cutting and pasting a hunk of this um, the string of glucoses to, a, uh, to create a branch, okay. And another name for this branching enzyme is called 4 colon 6 transferase. There's some other names that you might come across like amylo 1416 transglucosidase. There's some other names for it, but, but um, branching enzymes fine. And actually, the reason why this is here is because uh, there are individuals who are born with a defect in this enzyme. And that's uh, going to be one of those glycogen storage dis diseases glycogen storage disorders. It's actually called Anderson's disease or a glycogen storage disease type 4. And in those individuals that have this problem in this branching enzyme, uh, they, 
they have these linear glycogen chains that are insoluble, causes some liver dysfunction, and those individuals have lots of problems. They end up having eventually liver failure. Okay, and so it's important to keep in mind that um, uh, the, the, that the, the reason why we have these enzymes listed is either that they're hi highly regulated or they're sites of disorders. Okay, and so these are the two ones that you ought to really think about when you think about the entire glycogen synthesis pathway. Now, I just want to point out one other thing. It's a minor point, but we see that we have this UDP over here, and that UDP can just be phosphorylated again back to UTP to kind of keep this going. And I'm highlighting this because I want, to, I want you to see that glycogen synthesis is an energy requiring process. Okay, we need energy for that. And, um, and, and it's also like a lot of uh, synthetic pathways, right? We require some ATP to do that. So you can imagine that some of the ATP is going to come from the glucose oxidation glycolysis making some ATP and that might be helpful to help um, get this glycogen synthesis pathway running. Okay? Now, um, we go back to the beginning where we started. We've discussed the major locations. We've discussed the structure. We've gone through the pathway. And now we're going to finish up with some regulation. And I told you in the beginning that the regulation of glycogen synthesis is pretty straightforward. It's not as complicated as glycolysis. Remember, in glycolysis, there were three major enzymes that were regulated, and they were regulated in different ways. And we had to go through that in detail. For glycogen synthesis, the major enzyme that is the site of regulation is glycogen synthesis, okay? And its mechanism is through pKa phosphorylation of glycogen synthesis, um, of glycogen synthase. Okay, and when pK phosphorylates glycogen synthase, we can predict what would happen, can we? If we go back to our picture, okay, over here, remember that glucagon uses a GS receptor, which means that when we're talking about pKa, pKa is the glucagon signal in the liver. And we know that glycogenesis needs to be turned off when we're fasting. We don't want to be making glycogen. We want to be breaking it down. So, it shouldn't be a surprise that when pKa phosphorylates glycogen synthase, it turns it off. Okay, so we can go back. We can see that pKa, when it phosphorylates glycogen synthase, right, it turns it off. Okay, it makes it less active. And so to summarize for fasting in well-fed state, okay, when we're fasting, remember we have low blood sugar, so we're going to increase glucagon. All right, we're going to increase cyclic AMP and CAMP. Uh, cyclic AMP and PKA. And then we're going to decrease glycogen synthase. All right. All right, now when we're in the well-fed state, okay, we're going to have less glucagon because we're going to have insulin secretion, right? We're going to have a decrease in cyclic AMP and protein kinase A. And as a result, glycogen synthase isn't going to be phosphorylated. It's going to be in the, in the non-phosphorylated state, and then we're going to increase glycogen synthase. So we're going to increase glycogen synthesis. Okay, so it should make sense to you that um, pKa would be doing this because we want to, we want to we want to turn off glycogen synthesis when we're fasting and when we want to turn it on when um, when, when we're in the well-fed state. So um, hopefully this lecture helped you understand the major sites of action, uh, major sites of um, synthesis of glycogen, a little bit about its structure, and regulation in the fasting and well-fed state. And that concludes this lecture on glycogenesis.